Tonight's panel, uh, we are joined by uh, these, uh, these three people here. Uh, we have uh, Wade Tinney. Wade is a founding partner and CEO of the uh, casual and social game company Large Animal Games, uh, which is really one of New York City's oldest and, and, uh, and most respected uh, game <coughs> development shops. Um, we have uh, Zach Wilson. Zach is the senior level designer at Chaos Studios which is uh, working right now on a, on a title that you're going to get to see a little bit of uh, called Homefront. Chaos is one of the, the few places in New York doing uh, large-scale uh, AAA multi-platform console uh, development. Uh, so we're excited to have him. And we have uh, Louis Kofsky, who's a, a partner and executive producer at Curious Pictures, <coughs> which uh, is an entertainment and animation and production company that's been in New York City for quite some time. Uh, doing a lot of work with the game industry and is now starting to uh, uh, develop their own uh, full-fledged uh, game development studio in-house. Uh, so we have uh, three perspectives on the subject of making games uh, in New York City and we're going to talk about what it takes to, to run a successful game company, to, to make games with the New York game scene, the New York game uh, community, the culture of games in New York City, and all kinds of, of topics. Uh, so why don't we start out uh, by, I'm going to have each one of these guys kind of just uh, talk about uh, their company, uh, talk a little bit about uh, what they're working on, give us a kind of general overview of, uh, of, of what they do and uh, a, a peek inside uh, of their particular company. And then, we'll, uh, and then we'll have a panel discussion where I throw some questions out to you guys um, and we generate some, some conversation and then we'll open it up to you guys for, for <coughs> Q&A. Um, so why don't we start with uh, Louis Kofsky. Um, Louis, if you wanna kinda just uh, take us through uh, what's going on at Curious. Sure, great. Um, I'll stand up and use my computer here. Um, so, Curious Pictures has been around, can you guys hear me, um, about I think 17 years, and we've done a lot of TV and a lot of uh, thousands <coughs> of commercials, and uh, in recent years we've uh, done more film work, and then I've spent a lot of time uh, developing, sort of cross-developing our expertise in animation and visual effects and storytelling and programming, uh, and translating those skills over it, uh, to game development. So for the last five years, we've been doing a lot of work with Harmonix Music Systems. Uh, we've done all of the animation for the Rock Band franchise. So um, I've just got a bunch of random kind of clips of different things. So like, oh, I'm gonna turn that down. So this is what some of that looks like. This is, I think we've done, I think in 2009, we did something like 18 hours of facial animation for games. And I think there was around six and a half hours of uh, unique body animation that goes into a game. To give you an idea, in a AAA title like Rock Band, uh, there's uh, like maybe six hours of original animation that goes into that. So it's sort of like three or four movies worth of animation. Um, and this is just sort of like a sampling of epic rock and roll. And uh, we do a lot of this animation using motion capture, uh, but a lot of it is also keyframe animated. So I can show you some more of that. Um, we also uh, do service work. We, we worked on the Beatles rock band. Um, and then more recently, we've done service work for um, uh, Rockstar Games here in New York. So we'll be doing, uh, we, for them, we do a lot of facial animation. So in the world of gaming, this would be called art asset creation. So we're essentially, uh, creating the art and, and animation and sometimes modeling, sometimes design. Sometimes people come to us and ask us to do, uh, help them do concept development. We'll bring different designers on board and help them do uh, visual development for the game. And then that sometimes will lead to creating models that will go into the game. But, but what we find that is that a lot of that work uh, tends to go overseas. So we really need to focus on really kind of high value added work there. Um, we've also forayed into um, casual games or iPhone games. We've made a couple of I iPhone games. Uh, this one is Sea Captain, which is like a uh, spinning plates type game, very similar to Flight Control. If any of you guys have ever played that or Harbor yeah. Master. So um, it was a, sort of our first one, and it was just to kind of learn what it would take to 
work on this platform and we looked at a lot of open source engines and, and things like that and ended up just sort of coding it from scratch. So that gives you an idea of what that game is. And then there's another game called um, Bike Club, which I may have a, so let me just scroll out. I sorry, apologize for not being <coughs> more organized. Um, so this was, a, this was a short game that we did. Um, that, I'll skip you. Great. And then I'm just going to, in the background here while I talk, roll a little bit of footage of what a motion capture stage looks like. Um, and this is just a making of of some random uh, stuff. So sort of how some of you may be film students. I actually used to teach here uh, at Tisch. And uh, so a lot of the, what we're seeing, you know, it's an exciting time. The re part of the reason we got into gaming in recent years is that you can actually tell really meaningful stories. And so if you played through an entire, um, you know, full, full console title, it might be equivalent to watching like three seasons of a TV show, which is, you know, a season of a t TV show may be anywhere from um, 11 to 20 hours. Of, of TV as opposed to a movie, which is like two hours. So it shows the level of immersion that, that you're really starting to get into. And what you see here is you see the actors acting, and then that's their data converted into dots. And just as an aside, you know, probably the future of filmmaking is probably, I mean, we see it with things like Avatar, but you can imagine a world where we take away the dots and we just have an array of high definition cameras, and you're sort of doing your cinematography after the fact. Um, and, and uh, so after, after several years of doing all of this service work and then doing some of these smaller titles to sort of proof, proof that uh, pipeline out, uh, we began uh, doing our own original titles. And uh, we just had an announcement that was made, I believe, last week with, uh, that we're developing uh, a game uh, with Eric Zimmerman, who's up in the audience as our lead designer. Um, as well as a number of, of other really talented people uh, with Deepak Chopra and we're converting sort of his ideas and his universe into sort of a new type of game that's going to be combining meditation and spiritual practices and the introspective arts um, with gameplay. And um, so we're hard at work on that and that's going to be released on the Connect, which is the new uh, human interface uh, project from Microsoft where you don't need a controller to play the game, uh, the Wii and the, and the DS. Uh, and that sort of came about um, because the, the reason games were interesting to me was having worked on many documentaries, I, I worked with Morgan Spurlock and we worked with Brett Morgan and we had a documentary that opened uh, Sundance a few years ago and just had a documentary on 2012 that opened in New York last week. Um, I, I found I was reaching a very small audience and, and having very little impact uh, on the world despite working really hard. And I felt that games uh, were a much more engaging uh, form of entertainment where people were actually taking agency and making decisions. And, and uh, I feel it's a very uh, meaningful way to engage uh, people and, and sort of get inside their minds and, and their views uh, on a more deeper level. Um, so, uh, you know, I kind of went out into the world looking for projects that, that might fit the bill of, of, and, and partners, and that's sort of how the collaboration with Deepak came about. And so we're, we're full up, and we're working with a couple of other studios. Um, Powerhead Games up in uh, Chelsea is uh, working on our DSQs, and then we're working with a programming team out in New Jersey. Uh, again, with the intention of keeping everything local and uh, fostering the New York game development <coughs> community, um, we are uh, in full development on console games, which is a hard thing to do in New York. We're also involved in other uh, Facebook gaming and, and uh, you know, web gaming and, and, and various forms of, of more traditionally casual games, but this is sort of the main uh, bulk of, of where we are in terms of the you know, high value added entertainment um, and you know, really immersive experiences. So um, that's the that's the blurb. Sorry if it was a little um, incoherent. Tried to pack a lot in there. No, that was great. You can ask more questions later. Yes, um, awesome. Great. Um, cool. Thanks. Um, so actually, why don't uh, why don't we, we we hear from Wade next? And while you're setting up, maybe um, I will. Uh, 
if I could just ask you, uh, Lewis, a couple of, of questions uh, while, while Wade is setting up, uh, just to dig a little bit deeper into what's going on in Curious. Um, the, um, the, was the, the, the sort of transition from, from doing animation and, and art development and design stuff uh, and creating media for games to doing games uh, completely in-house. Was that a gradual uh, thing that happened or yeah. was there like a, a point where you said, oh, let's make the switch and like really flip it around? Did it really happen slowly over time? Or? It was a, it was a um, I sort of had a multi-phased plan that I convinced my partners that it was a good idea to spend a bunch of money to cross-train people and, and go after uh, new types of clients. Uh, and, and actually developed the game Sea Captain was our first fully in-house developed game. Uh, so the sort of stage one was uh, to do art assets for games. Stage two was to do work for hire game development. Uh, and then stage three was to do our own original IP. And, and the idea there was that each sort of progressive stage we learn a little bit more about the game development process. It happened a lot faster than I thought it would. And part of what enabled it to happen was the big economic crash when sort of leading on to 2008, everyone was sort of like, okay, that's great that you can, I was out at GDC, and I was like, we do all this stuff, but we don't do the rest of the package, which is the programming and the game design. We don't really care that you're capable and experts in this other area. And then when that, when that crash happened, all of a sudden, kind of all bets were off, and people were willing to take risks and think about things in different ways and, and realize that kind of everything and the way that the game development uh, system had been working is kind of broken. And so that was sort of our break, and that's when we were able to do these low-risk games on the iPhone, which was also another interesting opportunity, which sort of is in the process of breaking many of the rules of publishing, where prior to that, you know, a developer might hope to take 30% of a game, and the publisher would be 70 in the best of all possible worlds, and all of a sudden Apple has flipped that, where anyone with $100 and a computer can uh, enter, the, enter the market and keep 70% of the proceeds of the game. And so, um, yeah, the, the process was uh, less gradual than we thought, and we, we did have a lot of in-house programming talent, and then we did bring in. Uh, we spent a year recruiting and, and bringing in, but all, again, all local homegrown talent uh, to work with us. Cool. All right, thanks. Um, all right, so uh, Wade awesome. Tinney, uh, Large Animal Games. Okay, uh, let's go with you. Um, so, uh, yeah, I started a company called Large Animal Games about 10 years ago. I have one partner. Um, he and I met in grad school at, at Parsons, uh, graduate program at Parsons. And, well, I actually just wanted to quickly call out, I see the Muse guys are here. I see mm. Tam from Neuronic is here. Are there any other game development, like professional game developers here, Oscar? Where are you guys from? Chaos. Chaos. He's from Chaos too, raise your hand, bro. <laughs> Chaos. Anyone, someone over here, I saw a hand over here. Okay, well, just wanted to give a shout out. Yeah, to let's this actually ra raise your hand if you are an active uh, participant in game development. If you just like put your hand up. If, okay, so that's good. Okay, great. Oh, yeah. Nice. Okay, cool. And then I'm also just curious the other people that are here, are you here because you're looking to move into the game industry after you graduate? How many people fit into that category? Yeah, raise your hand if you want to become a game developer. Okay. If you're thinking about that. And okay. raise your hand if you didn't raise your hand yet. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. So you're just hangers on and curious, curious folk. That's good. So, uh, so large animal games. We started ten years ago, and I think uh, I'll, I'll just run through our, our trajectory real quick because I think it's interesting because it's actually a trajectory that's similar to some other uh, game companies in New York. Uh, we started out doing work for hire, uh, web and. Uh, mainly web, flash and shockwave games, working for brands. So we built a bunch of games for like Lego and uh, Mattel and the New York Philharmonic and you know, websites that had an audience and wanted sticky content for that, for that audience, a reason for them to hang out on the website and, and do stuff, interact with the brand. Um, and that was kind of, we didn't take on funding when we started. We just, we, from the very beginning, we needed to make money, right? So. The way to make money, one way to make money <coughs> making games is by um, getting hired by these brands or, or website operators. So we were just two guys at that point, uh, my partner Josh and I, we worked with some, uh, some contract artists, 
And then as we got, as we started to have some games out there and kind of grew our portfolio, we started getting bigger and bigger gigs. We also, in between doing those work for hire gigs, we were creating our own game. So we created a little puzzle game, for example, and we went out, we went out to GDC. Um, it's incredibly expensive if you're just starting out. I mean, it's like, I don't know, $1,800 or something. Went out to GDC and, and just started networking, trying to show anyone we could this little puzzle game that we had made, and we ended up getting a distribution deal with, with Shockwave.com. And so that, that kind of uh, validated what we were doing, and it also opened our eyes to this other way of making a living making games, which was make content, put it on, uh, distribute it through websites, and get a piece of the advertising revenue that they generate. So that market, unfortunately, went away when the dot-com uh, bubble burst. And what rose out of the ashes of, of that uh, of that destruction was the download game market. So this was making PC games that you install and run run natively on your PC, but that are distributed online through websites like Real Arcade or Big Fish, Shockwave.com as well. And so they're kind of, it's essentially what they did is they took all that web content that they have, all those f small flash games, and they kind of souped them up, made them richer, uh, made them feel more like a full PC application, and they started selling them in what's called the try before you buy model. And this was the casual download market. So you would download a game, you could play it for 60 minutes for free, and then if you liked it, the player would, would pay typically $19.95. The developer would see a piece of it, actually the smallest piece of it. The uh, Yahoo or the other or the distribution partner would see uh, the lion's share of it, and then if there's a publisher involved, they would they would see a piece of it as well. So that was that was our focus for about five years. We built I think 15, 14 or 15 PC games during that time. And just to give you a sense of the the production scope, these were projects that averaged about five, a team of five or six guys or guys and gals, five or six people working for somewhere between four and eight or nine months, okay? Um, and so when it started out, that was actually quite an interesting market and it was, it was great for indie developers because you could make something with uh, on your own dime and you could get it out there, you could reach out to these distribution partners and get it, get it distributed fairly easily. And unfortunately, after a while, the, the, that market started to kind of uh, coalesce around a certain very few game types and it became less interesting. All the publishers started working with uh, teams and uh, overseas. So actually that's kind of a theme here, I think, that we should talk about. This idea of, of development, leaving the States and leaving New York and going to cheaper places. Um, so then in July of 2007, Facebook opened up their API. So that meant that now developers could make games that pulled in data from the social graph and used it as game objects in the game, which we immediately you know, were captivated by just the creative opportunities that that afforded. And we pretty soon decided to abandon the downloadable games market and to turn the company again in the direction of social games. So in early 2008, we, we shifted our focus and we began the process of transitioning to uh, more of a, a service-based company. So, we started out, uh, again, doing a mix of totally self-published work, so just coming up with concepts ourselves, putting them out there in the space, and, uh, and figuring out how to monetize them. One of the great things about Facebook, and one of the ways I would say that it's, it's revolutionized, revolutionized uh, online games, is that it's really opened up the business model for developers. So rather than being beholden to a, a big fish or a real arcade, now developers could try out different things. And one of the things that, that we can try out is the virtual item model. And so that's been a huge focus of ours. Um, I think it's also been a good thing for independent developers. Um, and what I want to show with you, share with you today is just that we did a quick reel. And actually, it's funny. I. Uh, for some reason, this reel is like double time. So it's like the Charlie Chaplin, Chaplin view. Of, uh, <laughs> the 
or it's just like some amazing savant playing our, <laughs> playing our games. But so, this just to give you a sense of the type of games we've done, this, this, is a, uh, this particular one is original. Uh, sometimes we license someone else's IP and build a game around it. So Lucky Strike Lanes, you might recognize, they have a real bowling alley up on the West Side Highway. So these are all Flash games. Uh, the development for these is more like, uh, well, it's it's not dissimilar to uh, to the download team size. So typically between five and, well, we get up to maybe 12 people working for four months to get to launch. And then the unique thing about these games is that that team continues to work on them after they launch, right? Adding new content, uh, responding to uh, what players are doing, adding new features. So some of you may recognize this is a great game, great tabletop game called Bananagrams. Uh, we were brought in by uh, another East Coast publisher called Majesco to help them create the Facebook version of it. And we also created the iPhone version of this game. So this is real-time multiplayer. This is a, a fashion theme game uh, where you're kind of dressing a model for a specific scenario each day and then going through and voting on your friends and other players' models. We have, oh, it's going, it's, because Charlie Chaplin's playing, you can't really see, but there are brands, one of the models here that's kind of interesting is there are brands who are paying us to have virtual versions of their clothing in the game. And then this is our most recent release. Uh, it's called Office World. It's kind of, uh, has anyone played Pet Society? So it's kind of like Pet Society meets The Office. So you're kind of doing ridiculous tasks and you know maximizing productivity and stuff like that. <laughs> so there's, this is Waste Paper Basketball. You'll see naturally a big part of Facebook games is, is echoing out to your friends that you're playing it and trying to give them, uh, convince them to come and play with you. The, the, the resource constraint here is energy, which is represented as coffee. And one of the interesting things we did in this game that we haven't seen anyone else do on Facebook is that you can design avatars uh, for your friends, like in a, in a Nintendo Mii's kind of way, and create it for, for your friends and then send them something that says, hey, I've already created an avatar that I think look, looks just like you. Come and play the game and, you, and see if you agree. So we're up on 29th Street uh, in, I don't know if it's Chelsea or the Garment District. I always call it the Human Hair Wig District because it's for some reason, we have like multiple human hair wig option there. Um, uh, and fur, lots of fur coats. So we're 21 people uh, in, a, in a big loft space up there. Uh, the team is split pretty evenly between engineers, artists, and then other. And the other is, is game designers, producers, um, support staff, people like that. Um, we do everything in house except the one thing we consistently outsource is our audio, our music and sound design. That, that music that was playing was actually original composition um, by, from a guy in New York that we worked with over the years. And um, I'll leave it there so we can get to questions. Great. Well, thank you. So um, then, Zach, why don't you set up on, right, yeah. on your, yours and, and while, while that's happening? Um, uh, wait, let me just ask you uh, also a quick yeah. question while we're setting up this one, which is, um, uh, so over the course of, and I'm going to stay on the end here, All right, more appropriate for a moderator. Um, so dur during those um, transitions from doing work for hire to doing downloadable to now doing uh, Facebook stuff, um, have those been, uh, is there any one of those that, that, that uh, are, are you, from a, from a creative point of view, are you more sad or is, are you, have you enjoyed every step of the way or were there some that were more or less rewarding to just from a creative perspective working on? Do you, you know? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, we really feel like we've found a home in what we're doing now and now feel, 
And mainly, I would say, because we have the closest connection to players and the most active dialogue with players and the, and the greatest ability to see how our games are being used. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I think as a designer, I have a, an appreciation for all the challenges we face and all the different, the different markets and distribution uh, types and platforms we've worked on. But um, some of them... You know, in the download space, for example, we were we were always working through this filter of the portals, yeah. and so, and they didn't want in many cases they didn't even want to share with us data back, and so it was kind of a black hole. We would create something, throw it out there, and yeah. it was only when we got the you know the rare email from a player or brought people into the studio and did you know in person testing that we really got to understand, yeah. you know, <coughs> what worked and what didn't work. Yeah. So just not. You know, I, I really like the fact that now we can iterate yeah. and that we are releasing things that are kind of at 60 to 75%. Yeah. Um, and that we're able to make uh, design decisions based on, on player feedback and, yeah. uh, and metrics. So. Yeah, cool. Thanks. Um, all right, so then um, our, our third guest is, uh, is Zach Wilson from, from Chaos. So why don't you uh, show us? Yeah. yeah, so I'm, well, I'll show that in a minute. I'm, um, sure. Yeah, I work with Chaos Studios. I'm a senior level designer. I don't own the company like these guys do. Um, I'm kind of <laughs> like, you know, you guys. Yes. I'm there on the ground making the content. Um, but okay, so Chaos Studios started, I think, six or seven years ago. And they started out as Trom Studios, which was, um, they were a mod developer for Battlefield 1942, and they did a mod called Desert Combat. Uh, I wasn't <laughs> here at the time, but they, um, and it was a super popular mod for, um, for Battlefield 1942. I played it for like a year straight, which is what attracted me to the company. And um, they ultimately ended up, it was so popular, they ultimately ended up doing work on Battlefield 2 a little bit, on the multiplayer aspect of that, for a little while. And I think that they were gonna kind of have a deal with EA, and it sort of fell apart. And then, and I'll never understand how this happened, but they sort of spun that into a deal with THQ to do a full-on AAA title called Frontlines. <laughs> So, you know, I mean, it just goes to show, like, the main lesson from that is, if you want to make games, make games. You know, if you have something to show, you can convince people you can actually do it, and you can do it. So they ended up um, building front lines. I came on at the very start of that project about five years ago and worked through uh, the production of front lines, which they managed to do on time and on budget. You know, in, like, two years, they staffed up from 15 people to, I think, 80 towards the end which is really impressive that they managed to get it done in two years. You know, I've seen games go on for four years, you know, spend $40 million and just get canceled. And so uh, for them to be able to do that is pretty spectacular. And when we got done with that, we were considering doing a sequel to Frontlines, but we ended up doing um, a new IP called Homefront, which we're working on now. And um, we're in the last weeks of development of that. And it's like, I think we have eight or nine weeks, you know, so we're crunching right now, which is as horrible as it sounds, you know. Um, it's actually not that bad, it's pretty bad. But <laughs> <laughs> these, guys, yeah, these guys are here. They should be actually. They should be at work. We didn't make our, we didn't make our bug count today, so you know, they're making us stay late. But um, are you guys going back to work? I'm not going to go back to work. <laughs> <laughs> you know you're on camera, right? Yeah, <laughs> right. They, they can deal with it. Um, and so yeah, we're finishing up right now. So um, we actually yeah we just had our first hands on in Montreal, um, which went spectacular, and we're really excited about the game. And what I'm going to show you here is our E3 demo this year, from this year, which was uh, fully playable on Xbox 360, and uh, I'll pick that up real quick. And I think actually, yeah, Curious does some work on this as well. Yeah, we did uh, a lot of animation and levels. So yeah, so this is uh, That's our office girl, Victoria Lee. She's like the girl who's coming to the office, and she has this like incredible voice, so she does all the Korean propaganda. So the story of Homefront, if you don't know it, is North Korea invades the United States, and then two years later, our game takes place. So it's kind of like uh, the thematic stuff is um, all about what it's like to be, you know, somebody in a brutal resistance in occupied America, kind of on the other side of the occupation. So yeah, so that's all. Um, this is all real time, all in game on, on Xbox 360. Uh, curious did the animation for those guys, um, and I did the level design for this. So this is, and that's just basically like layout and scripting. So all of like the triggering of events, when things happen and how they happen, that's all the work that I did. I think like 25 people worked on this for about six months. So you know, you're looking at like, you know, 12 man years of work to get this seven minutes of game done, which is insane. 
I, I think I've seen this demo probably about a thousand times. That's not even an exaggeration. But this is show, This is a player walking through the world. Yeah, this is this is fully playable. This is the start of the second level of our game. So it's like you know we have the whole first part, which is the introduction to the world, and it's all the action. And then you get blown up, and you wake up. You wake up in bed, and um, then you get to see this world. And this is all about showing um, what the world of Homefront is really like, how these people are living in um, you know a post-carbon, post-peak oil world fully occupied by the Koreans, you know, they're just like living in suburban backyards. Have some sense of community. So the, the whole theme is to kind of like um, show people, um, at least we're free. to kind of bring the, the fight to the world that you failure. recognize, you know, like not like some no era stand in, you know, Slovenia or whatever. It, it's like really like recognizable places, real suburban America. Fences, tree cover, and that camo scrim keep us hidden from the KPA. And we Still use um, be careful. we use Unreal Engine, which is obviously I think it's one of the most popular, if not the most popular engine to develop on. Get Opera on the radio. He's prepping the safe. Just pros and cons, and it's uh, coming out on Xbox 360 and PS3. Talk to Connor PC. about ammo. Everything we eat, we grow. Water collections over there, and between the solar panels and the windmills, it's just enough power. To Looks out for fools, drunks, and Americans. Which means we're set to go, right? Keep it down. I'm damn tired of sitting here. We got a short window to grab those tracking devices, and we should be funny, actually, these around. guys, um, that's Connor and Boone, are two main characters. Um, one of the things we're really focusing on with this game, and that's a big initiative at THQ, is uh, quality. So uh, that's why Z came out, actually. He was hired as a contractor to help us. Um, really up the quality of the character. So if you see the characters of the game now, like, I think they look pretty good here. I don't have an eye for this stuff. There's a designer and a writer. And, but I, they've considerably changed and brought up the level of quality on these characters, and it's, it's a really significant improvement. So what you're going to see in the final game is you know, uh, much different than what you're seeing now. And so that's one of the, um, actually one of the challenges that we face in the city is... Um, in a lot of other cities like Montreal and San Francisco, you know, there's a really broad pool of skilled developers that we can draw from that have really specific skills. You know, like if you want uh, a lighter who has experience doing AAA um, first-person shooters in the Unreal Engine, you're not going to find that in New York City right now. So we have to go and we have to convince people to come to New York City who might have families, which you know is like people are scared of New York City. So that's one of the big challenges we face is finding guys who have these extremely specific skills to come and do uh, these, like, you know, really high quality work. We have to time our movements between Korean patrols, so we got a few minutes. You might introduce yourself around. I'll meet you on the other side of the So one of the things I do on this is I do um, writing and backstory stuff. So we spent like six months working with um, guys who actually consulted the CIA, coming up with a plausible backstory about how North Korea could invade the United States of America. The pilot, which was, you know, not the, that's not been the easiest sell. This guy actually, this is um, our uh, getting that guy to actually pour the liquid into the thing. Was that was a that was a difficult process? And one day we came in and it just worked. Like our our uh, lead technical designer came in and uh, just made it work somehow. So it's like the, you know the, the big thing about this is all the detail, all the little bits, everything being thought out. Like um, in this future, you know, there's not a lot of fresh water and there's not a like a food supply. So that guy has to be using the the pedals to pump water up so they can distribute it versus carry it. 
That, isn't that the first ever use of a Stairmaster in a first-person shooter? Yeah, it's supposed, it's, like, you know, it's supposed to be super ironic, too. It's like, we're very clever. <laughs> this is all like, my, this is my personal meta-commentary on suburbia. So yeah, and then we get into the whole gun thing. You know, This game is a first-person shooter, so there's a lot of killing Koreans. Exactly. Uh, of, like, you know, Listen killing the faceless other. It's kind of our, 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 our you ever uh, read the book Arsuang? You know the book Arsuang? Yeah. We'll be outnumbered and outgunned. So grab a weapon and as much ammo as you can carry. But I think that's it's something interesting to note about New York game development. I, mean, I think the games you guys make are really smart with super intelligent backstories. And the front lines of the war was also a decoil world mm -hmm. and, and sort of talking about a lot of things that are happen happening today, China and Russia doing joint military exercises and things like that. I think there's a level of intelligence. So that's the, uh, that was the This way. Yeah. Great. I'm just waiting on the other side. Uh, is there going to be a PC version of this? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. We have a producers. <laughs> That's actually being done. Uh, that's actually no, these things are so big and they're so complicated that it has to be outsourced to um, a Canadian company called Digital Extremes. So we have a whole group of other people making sure we can get the PC SKU up to the level it needs to be. It's going to be released a month later. But yeah, so another one of the things we're trying to go for too is capturing this like Americana of big box stores. And then the final game is going to be a service set. So we kind of like we've really gone to try to get like recognizable brands that make it feel less like a back lot world than a real green world. But this gets really popular. Christ, there's a lot of them. Okay, Connor, bring it. Copy that. Uh, yeah. We don't want to no. see any gameplay. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Plus, I just want to say it's available for pre-order now. So support New York Game Development and Amazon.com. <laughs> and uh, your mom, your grandma, and everyone. Again? <laughs> but, uh, yeah. What are what are the uh, what's the platforms? It's gonna be PC. Uh, yeah, PC, Xbox 360, PS3, on live, I guess. And um, <laughs> I'm an on live believer, by the way. I'm not knocking on live. And it's gonna be out in March 2011. God willing, and uh, yeah, we're supposed to be done content complete in eight or nine weeks. Great. And and about how big is uh, chaos? Uh, how big is chaos? I think it's like 130, 140 and people. Where where are you guys? Uh, we're on, on 27th Street near FIT. 27th between 6th and 7th. Okay. Yeah, it's kind of like the sketchiest place in New York City <laughs> to make games. It is pretty dodgy. Um, it's not that far away from like. No, it's actually close, like 20 two years. blocks from. Yeah, yeah. they're they're nearest, and actually four millimeters on 29th as well, yep. aren't they? Yeah, they're no, another. They're, they're, they're on 21st. 21st. They're, oh, 21st. They're next to me. Okay. Yeah, they're next to Eric. Uh, Power, yeah. Powerhead's right there. So. Yeah. yeah, Powerhead's and, on 28th. Yeah, and then you're where is uh, Curious? You guys are down. We're on Lafayette. Right. Yeah. Block over. So you gotta oh. move up to the the 20s. No, yeah, no, game, actually, game that's the hotbed yeah. of game development. Yeah. Yeah. Contractually, we have to stay down here. <laughs> and, uh, and and so Zach and, and you guys do all of the uh, all of that development is uh, those 130 people like sitting in in um, in in Manhattan yeah or is there are there teams remote yeah we teams have as well? we have our entire development staff almost our entire development staff we do have a couple of outsourcers some guys in Montreal at the new THQ Montreal studio and um, our QA is outsourced to Phoenix and to I'm pretty sure India based on the names in the bug in the bug reports um, and. Uh, then we have our corporates in Agora Hills in California. So you guys got to be the biggest um, operation in terms of just like bodies in a room making a game yeah. uh, in New York City. So. Yeah, I'm not 100% I'm not clear how big Rockstar is. I know that they I do. I don't think they do a lot of the development of production, here, right? Rockstar yeah. doesn't do. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, uh, production. I know they're pretty um, small. Cool. Well, uh, awesome. Thank you uh, very much. And and maybe we'll just kind of launch into a, a, a conversation. I mean the. Sort of the, the, the premise of, of tonight's panel um, is that uh, there is a perception. I remember going out, uh, I was uh, out uh, having, having a drink with Stephen Totillo, mm -hmm. um, who's a, a game journalist um, here in New York City, and he was saying, you know, when I, when I go to Austin, um, there's a palpable sense of the game development community in Austin. I kind of can find them, there they are. And here in my own hometown, I don't get that same sense. I don't get the sense of a cohesive uh, game development community. So there's this, there's this sense that New York City doesn't really have the robust, thriving game development scene that it, that it could or that it, that it should. And I mean, do you guys think that that's true? Or is that a, is that a myth? Now, so we all kind of work in games, and, and you know, so we're doing our thing. But 
Is there a sense that there that it's still somewhat anemic compared to how it could be? I, you know, I don't know. I feel like it wants to happen. You know, I like I know that IGDA is trying to be more active in this area, and like you know, this is an evidence of. Um, people trying to like push it forward and I think it's like there's a, a critical mass that's starting to build and we're starting to see more and more development in the area and I think it like I feel like it wants to happen you know I feel like this is, has the potential to explode at some point mm -hmm. yeah I would agree with that I mean it, it, it has definitely grown I, I also run the New York City chapter of the IGDA so yeah. uh, and I've been doing that I think for about four or five years um, and the we've definitely seen you know the mailing list grow, the number of people at our events grow. We just had a, a we have a kind of just beer night co uh, mixer about every other month or every third month. And last night we had one, and you know there were fifty people on a on a Wednesday night. You know, so I think, and we've also seen more studios pop up. I think uh, actually the the social game. The whole social game thing has, mm -hmm. has spawned some new studios, and iPhone has helped some smaller shops form. So, I think what we lack is the is the big shops like <laughs> more big shops like like Chaos and what Austin has and what San Francisco has and LA is they've got big you know hundreds of people studios that draw people and their families from from all over. Right, they're big companies that can afford to relocate people. Yeah. Um, so. I think that's the big part of what's missing. Yeah. It's hard to set up a big studio in, in the city. Yeah. Um, I mean, is are the it, if it's hard to set up a, a, a big why, why is that? Like, what makes it hard in New York City to set up a, a bigger operation? Well, I can give you an example of why it's easier in other cities. Like THQ, like I mentioned, THQ just had their opening of uh, THQ Montreal, which is um, slated to be four uh, four hundred people in five years. And Montreal, in, is that the province? I don't know. I don't know what that means, but. Um, <laughs> The sure. province of Canada. Um, it, uh, <laughs> it's just North Korea. Yeah, so, so, yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> so, but they, um, so THQ made the, I guess the deal with Montreal is that they're going to staff up to 500 people, or 400 people over five years, and they're paying 37 cents on the dollar for labor over that period of time, which mm -hmm. is an unbelievable chunk of development costs. You know, like, where the, I think um, front line, or home front's going to be like $40 million, and to get somebody to invest you know, to bring, to build a studio in New York City that's paying you zero cents on the dollar, you know, versus Montreal that's like, you know, paying for a 30-year development cost or 40% of your development cost is like, I mean, the, the option is clear, you know, it's... Yeah, that's a really big issue. Yeah. I mean, I know, Lewis, you faced it as well. We've talked about it a bunch, but, I mean, I'll give you a very concrete example. We are helping a, one of the big paid, uh, you know, premium cable channels build a, a Facebook game around one of their properties. So they have another property coming out, and... We asked about it. They said, well, we are talking to studios up in Canada, and Canada is going to give us a grant that covers the entire cost of development. And beyond that grant, any, any additional dollar we put in, they're going to match that dollar, dollar for dollar. And you can't compete with that. I mean, that's, you know, it's one thing to... You know, try to come down, figure out ways to come down thirty percent so you can compete. But mm -hmm. you know, if they're if they're covering the entire cost, then you know, good luck. So, and I, as part of my role with the IGDA, I've gone out and spoken with, uh, you know, state, uh, state officials, city officials, you know, the mayor's office, and there's a there's a policy of just simply not, um, not discounting or offering any sort of incentive. So, yeah. that's something that New York is fighting against. Now, obviously, I think in uh, lots of other ways, you know, we kick Montreal's ass. <laughs> so, uh, and I, so to some extent, I take Mayor Bloomberg's point about not discounting, right? Because mm -hmm. his point is, well, it's New York. We don't need to discount, right? It's, we've got, it's, it's got the, the cultural energy that draws people. You know, we've got all these vibrant creative fields, and there's a reason to be here. There's a value to being here. So... I can see both sides of it, but it is very difficult when, as a, as a business owner, you're you're we're continually approached. I'm sure you are as well by people from New Orleans or Lyon or Ireland or Montreal. You know all these different cities who are actively trying to foster a hub yeah. of game development. Yeah, um, I think that yeah. the um, I mean that's a major issue. We face it in, in TV and film as well. There there is a credit now. 
uh, for film production, which is making a huge difference. Sure. Um, but I, I, I do think that the future of game development, and certainly our strategy, is I think it's very difficult for us to compete one, you know, head to head against the Austin, Montreal, Toronto, uh, and, and so on. But if we are using what our assets are here in New York, which is uh, you know very creative solutions and, and sort of an imagining of what games will be in two years and in, in five years from now. I think that's where the real edge is in New York. And, and certainly the trend that we're seeing, uh, the you know if I hear transmedia one more time, I'll shoot myself in the head, but that's the reality of the world we live in. And, and looking at, at how gaming is, is moving into, I mean, if you look at how the New York Times has evolved over the last two years and, and look at the trajectory of, of something like the New York Times and if you look at the way we consume media and if you look at uh, you know Jesse Schell and sort of you know his imagination of, of moving forward to, to um, what I'm referring to is he has an amazing talk that he did at, at uh, was it dice last year mm -hmm. where he talks about everything becoming a game it's sort of that type of thinking uh, that, that I think is the future for New York game development is, is sort of these interesting combinations of of many media being tied together uh, as a game, which is basically what Area Code is doing. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so there, yeah, there is the the, the notion that um, that maybe New York City will never be a good place to uh, to to be the host for un, for a large number of, mm -hmm. of big studios like Chaos who are doing very large scale projects yep. because of the economics. Um, I mean, or, or do you think that, that we might get to the point where we are start to see more of this? Well, I think it would be, uh, I mean, I could see those studios setting up shop, you know, kind of outside the city and drawing drawing on the talent pool in mm -hmm. New York. Um, with, a, with a studio like that, I mean, it's just it's just a real estate issue to some extent. Right. Um, but, but, I mean, real yeah. estate must be also expensive in San Francisco. How do we, how does New York, how does Manhattan compared to, to San Francisco in terms of real estate? Well, I think uh, part of, too, part of the thing about San Francisco, and I've only been there a couple of times, but one of the things <laughs> that San Francisco has, too, is they have this mind share, you know, this, like, um, energy associated with right. developing in San Francisco, because there's not just games there, you know? There's, like, you've got your Googles, you've got your, you know, all your VCs, all the tech stuff going on all around you, you know, and it's this constant, like, sort of incubator, it feels like, that mm -hmm. helps drive these companies forward and helps make them more successful. Yeah. And kind of lets you, it lets, it lets you have this garage mentality that you, know, you, you don't really get here in New York City. Yeah. And certainly the, the Well, I don't totally agree with that last bit, actually. I, I mean, mean, you don't get in New York City? The, the garage mentality. I mean, I think yeah. we, I totally agree that the, the Bay Area has a certain like zeitgeist of, of, of entrepreneurship and, and and the tech world is obviously, there. I mean, I think they have great schools, which also feed all that. But I actually think that the garage mentality is something that New York does have and can build on, right? I mean, we can start, you know, you guys can start small studios and make games and get them out there. You should I mean, start small studios. You should. And <laughs> I hope that you will. Um, and I think that, you know, to put a positive spin on the New York scene, I think that despite not being as big as some of the other hubs, that we actually have a tighter knit community. Yeah. Um, sure. And that, and it, in part it's just a function of size, right? I mean, everyone, everyone in the New York City game industry knows each other, if not personally, they know of each other or they recognize one another. <laughs> um, and so that I think is a huge selling point and it's great, that is a great environment in which to start start something, right? I mean, I think, there's a certain sense of like we all need, we're all in it together, trying to get by in, in this in this concrete jungle. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I want to pick up a little bit on what you were saying, uh, Lewis, about the the type of game development that is starting to emerge that does feel like it's very appropriate for New York City. So, the the kind of cross media stuff and the, you know the fact that uh, whereas we don't have as much of a homegrown kind of Silicon Valley style entrepreneurial technology uh, scene at San Francisco, we do have uh, these incredibly, you know, this is the, the hub for, for media companies and publishers and advertising agencies and for 
um, a game industry that is in transition <coughs> from thinking about games primarily as boxed product to thinking about games as services and you know communities and 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 a hybrid between all kinds of different uh, emerging revenue models and, and business models. Um, it does seem like that's one of the reasons that the, the <coughs> we're starting to, to bubble up and, and boil with energy and stuff. So, I mean, are there um, are there kinds of uh, you know games that are more appropriate for New York City along those lines? That, you know. well, well, I mean, I think just to sort of bridge the the two points that are, we're talking about now. I mean, New York's scrappier, and New York is more garage mentality. People that work in California are used to working in big machines, big comfortable studios. They, you know, big studios come out and see our studio, and they're like, oh my god, you do this here? You know, you, you're able to make all of this happen in one place with multi-purpose spaces and people that do a lot of different things. And just by nature of the fact that if you're in Los Angeles, most of your friends are going to work in movies <laughs> and maybe, you know, gaming right. and moving and that, you know, it's entertainment. That's it. And here you have a cross section of people that are architects and reporters. And, and, and so there's a, there's a much more interesting cross pollination and hybridization that's able to go on. And I do think we're in Francisco and in uh, Los Angeles. So we are able to pull talent here. And I think that, um, you know, being at the center of, you know, not being out on a coast, being at the center of, really where current events are happening and, and a lot of the large financial decisions in the world are made and I, I think there, there is a lot more sense of the pulse of what's going on in the world and what's pertinent and imagining sort of how people are living, living their lives and, and how people are, are communicating and doing uh, their daily tasks and beginning to make games around that and mm -hmm. I think that that is, the, we're starting to see you know, some very interesting specific examples of, of how that's working, you know, some of it in, in, in the Facebook world or in the mobile world and, and where those start to cross over and the ARG and, and it, you know, it's a, it's a very new frontier. Mm -hmm. um, you know, people could have written off the film, film uh, community in New York many years ago, but it's, it's still vibrant and alive despite the machine of, of what Los Angeles is. It's just different. And I think that the real question is, 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 is finding those niches and finding the, uh, you know, sort of the untapped areas and, and going after it. I, I don't really have the answer to what that is, but, you know, those are some of the threads, I think, that are going to compose the final fabric. Mm -hmm. um, so speaking of, of, like, recruiting and, and kind of drawing uh, talent to, you know, game development talent to New York City, um, what kind of talent are you guys looking for that you wish there were more of in the New York, uh, you know, labor? Yeah, role. well certainly uh, engineering is the one that we, we struggle with the most. Mm -hmm. So whether it's, you know, good flash engineers, uh, like computer science uh, background flash engineers or, or server engineering, I mean that's, that's, those are the two hardest roles to fill for us. We do there's obviously lots of great art schools in the city, so you know we're able to to pull from them, and uh, I think good producers. Well, you can you can train a producer who's had experience, make you know, uh, getting projects finished in a, an ad agency, for mm -hmm. example, or other types of interactive projects. Um, but then I guess the, the the higher level way of answering that question is just more is entrepreneurial people. I mean, that's what we're always looking for as a company: people who want to have that entrepreneurial drive and, and want to kind of create things that make, that impact lots of people and make a difference, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's us. What about at, at Chaos? Yeah, What's we're always, the, we're always looking for senior people who ship titles, you know, with very specific skill sets, you know, like we very, like looking for, my, my position in particular is very difficult to find like a senior level designer who has um, like unreal experience? It's it's diff actually difficult anywhere. Like I have a friend who's working at Irrational now, and you know you just they're very difficult to find these people, um, and it's uh, like and also producers, you know, producers that can be trusted to shepherd a, a product of this size, are very hard to come by. You know, like once you find that guy, you know, if you're a company, you're not going to give that guy up. You know, you're going to do what it takes to keep him on. Yeah. Um, and it's and so and so for us, it's just a matter of convincing those people to come from from Orlando or from San Francisco or from wherever. Yeah. Is it hard to convince someone to believe Orlando? 
<laughs> well, it wasn't hard. So, it wasn't. That's that's where I was. Before like this. Well, that's, that's actually that's where I was before this. You know, I was living yeah. in suburban Orlando. I was living. And I didn't have a problem with it, man. I was working on I was working on Superman Returns at the time, which was a nightmare project. And like, I needed to get counseling after that. But like my my girlfriend at the time, now my wife, had lived in um, you know suburban America her entire life. Yeah. For her to like come up sight unseen to New York City with me was this like huge leap. And I can imagine what it's like for guys who have kids. Mm. You know, like, how, I, because you have no concept of what it's like to live in New York City. Like, where do you live? Where do your kids go to school? Am I going to get mugged? You know, like, you know, people people don't know this, and so it's like, it's a scary proposition. Yeah. Are there any women working at THQ? There, yeah, there is. Um, there's a couple. There's a couple of girls. Yeah. Uh, no, we have two. Is, we have. I think we have three or four now. Four, yeah, we have four it, now. Um, one moved to Portland. It, it, so, <laughs> our pro, is it? Did you guys see our women and, and yeah. ask them to come work on site? There's a, um, there's a, uh, I think a, a, a kind of a stereotype in my head of programmers not really loving New York City, and I don't know if that's true. You, you were saying that it's kind of hard to get programmers here, and I mean, I was talking to. Um, uh, uh, someone at um, at a recent conference who's a, a brilliant programmer and a brilliant game designer and and um, and uh, lived in New York City for a little while and I was floating the theory that one of the reasons that it's hard uh, for game development in New York City is that it's hard to get programmers to move to New York City. Right. Programmers are really smart and they like warm weather and they, they put yeah. two and two together and. Um, and End up in Orlando. He, and he was saying that. <laughs> that's, that's, uh, part. Yeah, exactly, or, or California. And he was saying. Um, that it was more for him, the culture of New York City was the weather. It was more the culture. Like he, hmm. he described going to parties and having conversations with a lot of conversations with people who were looking over his shoulder to, to see who they were going to talk to next. Uh, that kind of uh, the, there's a, the, a little bit harshness of the of the social scene hmm. in New York City of people calculating. And, and I said, isn't that true in San Francisco? And he was like, no, it's not nearly as true as it is mm. in New York. So I don't know. I mean, that that's something. Well, you know, that though, I'll bet though, in the past five years, something's happened in New York City that's changed. And that's Google. You know, Google is here now. I don't know how long they've been here. My wife used to work there, and like they've got what five hundred thousand people on staff now. And that's like one of those things where it's like they're just mm. they can attract the best talent in the world. You know, and like for those people to come here and you know get jobs here and maybe they don't like Google and they quit but they love New York City and it kind of like filters back out yeah. and we have AOL as well too down in Astor Place which is another like huge enterprise group and I think that those are the things that are going to kind of start to attract and change the culture you know for the better yeah mm -hmm. um, that's really interesting I hadn't ever thought of that have you heard that from other folks? I mean, is it possible that he's just kind of no? Boring? I think yeah. No, no. I mean, who knows? I, I thought it was an interesting. I thought it was an interesting point, and I mean, I, I think that in a weird way, what we're describing is that there is a uh, a push pull thing about New York City. That it is that some people are super attracted to this yeah. place uh, because of the energy, because of the the, the creative energy, um, the the cultural energy, the fact that this is mm -hmm. the one of the one of the uh, world capital um, in in a lot of different ways, yeah. um, and the art scene and the theater scene and and media and journalism and writing, mm -hmm. um, in, intense kind of intellectual culture and uh, and music, um, and and so it does draw. It's like a magnet that draws people. Yeah. But at the same time, it's it's kind of hard to live here. It, 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 for some people, it's it kind of a harsh existence. Yeah. There's a lot of standing in line and getting shoved around and mm -hmm. pushing and, yeah. and there can be rudeness. And mm -hmm. um, and so, I mean, that's that's just an interesting I think dynamic. It. I mean, it's, I've worked on both coasts. I've bounced a couple times back and forth. And it's just, it's a lot easier to live and work in Los Angeles or San Francisco. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's easy to find an apartment. It, your, your daily lifestyle, it's a lot easier. It may not, you know, you don't have the peaks and valleys that you have here, and and I think that that, that draws a lot of people, to to the both between the weather and just sort of like, you know, I go to the Trader Joe's and I get all my comfort things and I come home and, you know, my living room can fit a large TV as opposed to <laughs> whether you even have a living room. So I think I think that's a big part of it right there. But then the flip side is if you go visit the big, you know, big studio campuses you know, in the Bay Area, down on the peninsula, they're just the most sterile, uninteresting, completely corporate and uninspiring 
Well, it's, it's, uh, it might be an outside view, you know, having, uh, I'll just use the, the personal analogy, it's not a game development studio, I went from Curious How to DreamWorks, and mm -hmm. it was like, yeah, it was sterile, and it was an office park, but we had, you know, amazing gym facilities, and sports fields, and everyone played soccer on a real grass, at, you know, out in the mm -hmm. real air every day, and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and it was, uh, you know, everyone got in their car at the end of the day, but the fact was, at lunch, you had uh, 250 or 300 people from all over the world who are on the top of their mm -hmm. game, all congregated in one campus. Yeah. And, and the EAs and, and Ubisofts and LucasArts can, can draw that type of talent. And so that's, you know, we're competing against the, it's similar to NYU mm -hmm. competing against a, you know, a Stanford or something like that. You've got yeah. a, you've got a um, concentrated group of people in a sterile, horrible place versus, you know, a much smaller, say, beleaguered group of people, you know, spread out in the fabric in New York City. Right. Mm. And, and two, and I think in defense of programmers, you know, like, they, they have a tendency to be a little bit of a standoffish lot, you know, they don't like the physical contact, but, like, um, the, the guys, some and, like, that's true, that's true for a lot of people in games, you know, across the industry, is they're, like, tunnel vision, you know, kind of very focused and obsessed, and um, the guys that we've attracted to Chaos in particular are, you know, some of the more social, like, artsy, mm -hmm. interesting people that, like, you, you don't really get that kind of um, sort of weird, creepy programmer guy who walks around in his socks all the time. You get more like, you know, you get, you, you get more like regular people, like regular guys that you want to hang out with. Like, I, we have some really cool programmers working at Chaos, like interesting guys who have real interests outside of, you know, Lisp, whatever, Lego Mindstorms, <laughs> as they do, which is, which, is, which is fantastic. You know, it's, fan, it's yeah. fantastic to see, like, like, the people that we do attract are the people that, like, you know, can hack it in New York City. Yeah, which I mean, there is something to be said for that, and I, I like to, I like to think that <coughs> it's not just a matter of the the economics or or what it takes to to make a you know from a from a business perspective a successful company here, but that that the that the the New York game scene will begin to establish its own personality totally. and put its own totally. stamp on the kinds of games that we're making here, mm -hmm. um, and that like the New York City film industry. Uh, uh, in some ways, was a response to the Hollywood machine, and and in the '70s, kind of reinvented film in some ways. Mm -hmm. um, that that, that, that there's, a, there's a certain um, attitude and approach that uh, reflects mm -hmm. the the energy of New York City, the the uh, desire to experiment mm -hmm. and to to try new things, yeah. um, and uh, and and maybe smarter and and. Uh, uh, a little uh, less uh, comfortable with the status quo and yeah, wanting yeah. to mix things up. Absolutely. Broader yeah. palette of inspirations, yeah. I think. Yeah. I mean, I think you're hitting it on the head, and I think that it's going to be a very interesting year. I think, you know, this is the first year, really, we're coming out of that the game industry is like, whoa, it's not exponential, infinite growth. And, you know, frankly, coming having crossed over from film and TV into gaming, you, I meet a lot of people that just would never make it in film and TV. It's like, you, 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 you're just substandard. You're just not good at your job. You, know, you have no business being in this industry. You get into a big EA, THQ, Ubisoft, any of these big companies, they, they've grown every year. So they're just sweeping people up off the street and saying, you've got two arms and you can hold a joystick or came out of QA and associate producer, go for it. You know, level designer, go for it. And what we're seeing now is that there's a lot of really bad games being put out and there's a lot that are starting to fail and you're starting to see these companies contract and so now we're getting into a much more competitive place where innovation and added value of every member on a team, on a development team, on a, on a, and a publishing team is important. So I think that now may be the time that we're going to see New York really start to rise because the, the formula is not working anymore. Put, right. Put so much money in, and you get a hit out, and you've hit your 20% margin, and maybe you know one in nine or a hit, and that covers your few losses. That's not working, and I think we're going to continue to see that trend because the economy's contracting, and it, it, it's it's the uh, the whole economy, the, the whole economics of the way the game industry works are changing. So I think that the competitive advantage that it takes to live in New York, to be creative, to be able to do more than just program to be programming and artistic and understand what it needs to be dead what it means to meet deadlines. I think that's going to rise to the top. So I think this is the time that we're going to see the area codes and and the uh, large animals, uh, you know, really start to, to rise. You know, that's that's awesome. my yeah. All right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I and I think that you know from a creative point of view, there's also a, a, a sense of, of people. Uh, there's a 
a growing desire for, for video games to mature as culture, to be yeah. more appropriate for grown-ups, uh, to be kind of less mired in, in some of the, the their, their, uh, you know, the more juvenile and, uh, and kind of lowbrow, and, and to, to be something that uh, uh, fully uh, explores the, the creative possibilities, and that to me feels like something that New York City is extremely good at. Yeah. So I like to Absolutely. think that you know New York City has a lot of what what video games need right now, and that that should be our mission. Yeah. Um, why don't we open uh, it up to the audience and see if there's any questions uh, for the panel? Uh, well, I'm finishing uh, my computer science degree, one year out, and I frankly don't know what to do next. Maybe uh, if I go straight straight to game development or do a master science degree. Don't or, do a master's. Just huh? come get my card. We'll talk after. <laughs> <laughs> Don't no, do, but the thing is, uh, I know my way around uh, game development. I've done games, a couple of games already in X and A. So, what would you do if you were, for example, in my position with your experience that you have right now? Well, I'll, I'll tell, I can tell you what I did when I first started out. Like my, my first job was an internship at Firaxis, um, working on a game called Civilization Three, which is not that big of a deal. Um, <laughs> it was, it was, it was like the most awesome experience of my life working with Sid Meier. But like, I got that job because. I didn't care, and I know we're supposed to be talking about New York City and the building of New York City, but I didn't care where I worked. You know, if they had, if there had been a job in Juneau, Alaska, I would have been like, let's go, man, I'm, I'm up for that, you know? So I sent out, you know, 200 resumes, and they're the one that bit, and that's it, you know, you just have to be open to new experiences. And the other thing, too, is like, you know, you said you've got experience working on XNA, that is gonna help. You know, like, because knowing the tools, like, um, I know with you guys, if somebody comes in and they don't have Flash experience, you know, and they're like, well, you know, I know Java, or something. I know it's like about a lot of it's about like knowing the tools, being in the right place at the right time, and having as broad of a palette of tools as you can have. And um, finally, what is the most important part? For example, if I want to get an internship, for example, in your studio or Large Animal or Curious, Curious Gaming. I mean, what is the most important part? For example, if I want to apply for an internship. Uh, well, I guess. Showing that you want it. I mean, it's kind of to Zach's point, I think, uh, showing that there's a real passion there and that uh, you're just looking to get involved. I mean, that's, for me, that's what I'm looking, that's what I'm trying to see when I'm looking at resumes and trying to pick up on. So just communicating that passion. Just to go back to the first part of your question, though, I absolutely do not think you should get a master's degree. Um, don't even finish your current degree. Unless you want, unless there's, you know, you want to go into some very specialized uh, field of engineering that requires, you know, uh, advanced study or something. But I just, you know, the mas a master's degree made sense for me because I was transitioning. I mean, my undergraduate degree was in Spanish literature, so I needed, to, I just needed to go back to school and, and you know, and uh, I didn't want to go back and get another undergraduate degree, so I chose a master's degree. But the most valuable thing about a master's degree is, or any graduate degree in my opinion, is the other people that you meet that are getting that degree, right? And you can, there's other ways to meet people if you're willing to put yourself out there and network. And I've just found that you learn so much more doing something than, you know, going to going to school. Yeah, so. An internship, you know, what are you gonna spend a year on a master's degree? You know, if you, if you take an unpaid internship, you can expect, you know, twenty dollar a day stipend, something like that. You do the math, you know, if you did that for the time that you would be even if you did it for the whole time you would be at a master's degree, you're gonna come out of that as a pretty deadly weapon. And I think that um, especially with the change in tools and, and you know, things, you're going to constantly have to reinvent yourself through your career. Uh, and constantly, it's going to be a constant learning process of new tools and, and collaboration. And you know, we, we look for people that are versatile, that are able to speci specialize in one area, be really good. You know, if you're a programmer, you're, you could be the re really good in one area of, of code, but, but also be able to create some assets and, and <coughs> be able to pinch hit when the producer's not in and, and, and maybe interface with the client a little bit or, you know, just, you know, follow what it is that you're good at and, and express that in your resume, express that when you're speaking to people, express that in your, you know, your examples or your website and that, you know, that's what you need. 
and and you know everything is collaboration. You know, rarely are you going to be the one guy that just does a project. So you need to be able to work with other people, yeah. and and uh, be able, you know be able to put your ego at the door and just be part of the team and and understand that what really matters is the the product that you're creating with people while you're while you're in the workplace. I'm and, uh, and so yeah, something that's what I'm going to say too is like. Um, if you do have the programming skills to do it, you know, get a game together and put it on the Apple on the uh, iPhone App Store. You know, if you have a game that sold twenty copies, you know, that might be more than the guy next to you. But like, you sold a game, you finished a game, you put it out there. You know, the balls to put it out there. You know, that says something. You know, like, I cannot reinforce the point of making games yeah. more. So I'm uh, I'm actually very I'm very sympathetic to this this idea that for some for many people. Uh, um, just uh, you know, uh, jumping into development however they can is the, is the key. But I feel like um, it behooves me to to speak out and <laughs> uh, give a little bit of support to the idea. Yeah, I was just you know, setting given, you up. Yeah, yes. given given the uh, the august institution that is hosting us yes. here, yes. Uh, NYU. So and, and I will say that you know I think um, that uh, for a lot of people, um, going to graduate school can, can be the the right uh, solution. Um, not because it's the right way to then get a job in the game industry, but I think for, for many people, it is the right context for making games. Yeah. Um, and uh, I think one of the things that uh, we're going to do uh, at the Game Center when we put together our master's program is really think about that, uh, that aspect of it. Like, the, mm -hmm. the, the industry is a particular context for making games, and it's a good one. Like, yeah. it produces, you know, the, the, the marketplace, the forces of the marketplace produce a lot of innovation. Yes. But they also push in a certain direction, totally. and that leaves some creative possibilities unexplored. Mm -hmm. I think that, that, that the, you know, an academic institution um, can be a context for doing really interesting work in and of itself. So yeah, if your if your goal is just to get a job uh, making games, it's probably be, you know doesn't make sense for you to think oh yeah let me get a, go get a master's degree. Um, but I think uh, if you, if you really do want to kind of experiment and explore mm -hmm. and innovate and try new things and you want a context that is going to support that, yeah. um, I know for, for our, the program that we're putting together will definitely will definitely do that. Yeah. Um, but I also I want to echo what you're saying about making games. In either case. Your main goal should be to get game, yeah. to get a game done, get multiple games done. Yeah. Because resumes, I don't know about you guys, I'm like resumes are just words on a page. It'll get you where if someone has built something, yeah. that's the main thing that, yeah. that that indicates the passion and the skill. And something so, else yeah. too, like I've known programmers, a lot of programmers, not a lot, some programmers who've you know gone into the into the business, you know, and done work and burned out or not been interested and went back to do yeah. master's research after they found what it is that they like about games. You know, like maybe they really like cloth simulation, but it's just they can't find someone to do R&D, and it's like there's a, there's a university right. that's like, hey, man, here's some money. You know, and it's like, what, and like that's the thing, too, is like, you know, once you have the experience, like universities will be more willing to give you, you know, the money to actually do your master's program. Mm -hmm. um, are, do we have any other questions Please. right, right uh, in front? And then we'll go over here. All right, um, question. If somebody has a pretty, like, maybe a lackluster computer science background, but they still seem well-rounded in other areas, like maybe something more in the design aspect or writing or maybe even animate or maybe even like just like design or like art, could they still stand a chance to make it in a New York uh, game? Don't stand industry? a chance, just give it up. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, no, absolutely. I mean, it just depends what you're, depends if you're applying to be an engineer or applying to be one of those other things. I'd say like writing and design probably not so much. You know, like the writers on my project, one of them's John Milius. You know, he's a Hollywood screenwriter, and we have like another guy. It's a pretty competitive, you know, environment to be in. You're probably not going to get in as a writer. I mean, maybe, but I doubt it. But um, art's an, art's another situation where it's like, you know, if you're producing assets and you prove that you can produce assets, that's one of those things where you will, if you can do the work, you'll be able to get in. Yeah, I don't think academic pedigree doesn't really mean that much to me. I mean, I don't know, maybe if someone's from an Ivy League school, I'll like, look at them for a second longer. But at the end of the day, it's about what they've done. You know, I'm either looking at their portfolio or looking at games that they've worked on. I'm trying to understand what they can really contribute. And the degree is important, too. Because you know? like, the degree says, like, I was joking about, like, you should stay in school and not do drugs. And well, like, <laughs> but like the degree well. says, but actually you can do drugs. That's big in the game industry. Um, that, that's not true. Um, the thing, like the thing about a game, about a about a degree, does say you know it does say you can show up on time consistently 
and you know get the grades to get a degree you know which shows commitment and shows the, you know the hard work and the ability to think laterally and think creatively so you know the degree the, the degree is important Eric um, I think are you interested in, in getting back. a job in games young man Sweet. maybe pass the mic back this is our honorary fourth panelist, Eric Zimmerman. I, I, I just want to say that uh, also as someone who's worked in the game industry a long time, I want to speak out in favor of, of getting an education when appropriate. Um, I remember I was, I was actually oh, in right, graduate school. Away from the mouth. I was, I was, it's too that? loud. It's, it's actually too loud. Sorry. I'm sorry. What did you say? <laughs> yeah. I can't hear you over my own voice. Point it away. I'll stick it up my ass. Oh, God. <laughs> um, I have to... New York right, City, next next yeah. question. Um, I was actually in graduate school, and I got an internship in the summer between my two years of master's um, education uh, at a company where Frank was working, RGA Interactive, which then was focusing on doing original PC titles. And they wanted me to quit school, and you know, I, I heard all of the same thing. They didn't respect an education. What's it for? It's not going to help you. I ended up doing my second year partially out of residence, kind of having my cake and eating it too and getting the degree. There's a lot of reasons to get a degree and, 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 and get in a master's school. When someone wants to hire you for their company, you have to remember they're, they're coming from a mercenary point of view. They, I think it's totally valid to say, you know, all other things being equal, um, you know, a, um, a person hiring you to a company wants to make sure that you can do your job that they're hiring you to do. So, <clears throat> All other things being equal, a degree is a great asset to have in your background, but it's not the thing they're hiring you for. But what you also should understand is that you know we 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 all play these big budget 3D console games and our and and when we love watching them, and dozens and hundreds of people have to work on those games. And most of the people working on those games are doing very small things. It's like if you're an animator and you end up working at Pixar, which is a dream of a lot of animators. Ninety-five percent of those animators are. You know, they're not creative directing. They're not making big um, design decisions. They're not, they're, they're doing small production work, very sort of low level production tasks. And if you do get, get a degree, you know, if, and, and you, you get a bigger scope, it's the difference, for example, between someone that, that remains a production artist and someone, or, and someone that becomes an art director, right? And that part of getting a master's degree, if you choose your education well and you rise to the challenge of giving yourself a good education when you're in graduate school um, or undergraduate school, is that it gives you uh, not just skill training, which I think is the sort of the, the lowest baseline, least interesting thing about going to school like NYU or, or other schools, but it, it gives you perspective on other fields. It lets you connect what you're doing to other forms of culture. It lets you see the relationship between game design and composing symphonies or game design and economics or game design and psychology, or game design and the history of art. And those are the things, ultimately, over the long years um, of your career and the decades of your career, that are going to make you do truly innovative work and that are going to um, help you rise in the company faster. Uh, eventually, if you stay in the game industry for decades, you will, you will rise up in, in the ranks. But it'll happen faster, and maybe you'll do more significant work if you get an education. Yeah. So, there are other ways to get an education than going to school and getting a degree, right? So, so I'm not saying that, that every school is great and that's the only way to get this education, but, but that, this is kind of what it's about. I mean, um, um, and again, you know, I'm working with Frank here at NYU and we're trying to create that kind of context here that, that promotes experimentation and, and innovation. So I, I just want to advocate for the idea of education as being more than skill training. You know, I, I, monkeys can, can be trained in skills, but I think that only um, it, it's going to take a lot of kind of uh, trying to break through the idea of uh, making conventional games, which I think everyone here on the panel is trying to do to, um, uh, you know, to, to really help uh, evolve the, the, the cultural form that, that we're also passionate about. And to tie it back into the theme of the panel, too, you know, I think that one of the advantages that New York City in particular has is that you have, it's one of the places that has you know, the broadest culture and like, the most interesting culture you know, surrounding us, like the architecture and the, yeah. the theater and everything, and that's like, gives you an advantage in um, the way you think about, you know, coming up with new ideas and, and creating new concepts. I think, I've found it to be much more stimulating than Orlando. So stay in school. Uh, or Baltimore. Well, one, one thing I just wanted to uh, add on this subject is that 
one when I'm looking at uh, or interviewing people or looking at resumes, one thing I'm always looking for more than any particular skill, because I totally agree with Eric on that point, is experience with having worked in a team. And so I would recommend to anyone that you aggressively pursue those types of collaborative um, exercises. Great. Um, I think yeah. that um, I, I just had a question. Where do writers fit in your staff? I'm, I'm, a, I'm a creative in the advertising business. been a writer for the past 20 years. Wrote a lot of award-winning spots. I became interested in the, uh, the gaming after hearing about uh, Frank's company, Area Code, and all the, you know, I was a big Lost fan, so all the, all the cross-media that they did. So I guess, uh, you know, where do, where do writers have a place in uh, your staff? They don't have as big a place as they should, um, quite honestly. And I think partly it's a function of our size. You know, we haven't, we don't produce enough, enough games at a at a rapid enough clip to justify having a full time writer. Right. But I guess uh, I guess a writer with an advertising background who knows how the companies work and knows how uh, a, a game would be branded or. Well, there is actually, we have, on, on our staff, we're large enough that we have a, um, and that's actually, he's the fellow who was kind enough to make me the DVD, um, a marketing guy on staff who represents our company to the rest of the marketing team and is not necessarily involved with writing, but is involved with, um, you know, integrating the global campaign into the work that we're doing and getting our work out and making sure that we have, um, you know, a smooth transfer of the assets and the ideas. That's and more, the, the more of an account person, it sounds like. Yeah, well, no, it's not. He's, he's definitely involved with, like, some of the strategy stuff and some of the creative stuff, um, but he was kind of like our voice in terms of marketing to the corporate guys in California. You know, so that's one of the roles that guy might have. You know, in terms of writing, in terms of creative and narrative stuff, like, I, I do writing, but I also do level design. Um, we have another writer on staff. We've gone through a couple writers in our game, man. It's a, it's a tough business to be in to be a game writer. They're not really respected at I, all. I, well, and as with, but to, touching back on the point of looking forward at the games of, of the future rather than the sort of dysfunctional, not to call you guys dysfunctional. It's dysfunctional. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 you know, the sort of br the current model as it stands right now, I mean, I think looking forward, I think as it is in film, uh, the story is king. And so, um, you know, in some of the projects that we work on, we, we don't call things scripts. Uh, we call them transmedia narratives. And, and it's sort of the backstory, looking at how the game will unfold, how the books unfold, how, you know, the fifth sequel might unfold, where you sort of have your roadmap and your whole, you know, the backstory of, of, of where everything came from, you know, going back, you know, 500 years to how the, how the you know, point in time where the game occurs. Uh, you know how everyone got there, and and it's very important. You know the framing uh, can be, it, you know, the make or break for many of these games. Right. It you know, seems like it seems like Lost or uh, you know Campfire, the agency Campfire that did you know True Blood, that that whole campaign. They um, actually do work for us too. They're doing all of our viral stuff. And they, Camp, uh, campfire. They're pretty awesome, man. Yeah, I mean, again, it's uh, everything's merging. It seems totally. like you know the, yeah. the, the story, the you know branding, the game. Yeah, um, yeah. Advertising, yes. advertising's getting really weird. I, we, we're actually so at, at my company, Area Code, we're we're working with writers on uh, Facebook games. That uh, we just launched a, a Facebook game for CSI, mm -hmm. and um, one of the ideas, this is a crazy idea we have, is that. Uh, that, uh, the, that you're doing these cases, and each case is like a little tiny episode. So each case is a narrative, and we're actually working with writers from the show um, who are constructing these cases, working with game designers um, to build these little miniature narratives uh, that are gonna be in a Facebook game. So that's kind of a, a new thing for Facebook. But I also wanna just, uh, I mean, you, you, you have to answer that question for yourself by, uh, by playing games and discovering what moves you, right? Because there is no answer that is like a, like an intellectual thing that you're gonna find out about or read about. It's like, oh, it's gonna click. You're gonna, it's gonna click if you, uh, it, it, by, by you, you know, connecting to, to stuff that's happening in, there's amazing writing that's happening in games uh, in a lot of different ways. So I would just like to shout out to what Valve is doing, for example. Um, Valve, such a smart company, making, uh, you know, shooters, basically, first-person shooters. Um, they uh, hired uh, a couple of guys from a website called Old Man Murray. So 
uh, Eric Wolpaw and Chet Fasseslek, right? um, and uh, and these you know these were writers. Like Old Memory was a basically a comedy site about video games, um, and Gabe Newell uh, like just recognized the, the brilliance of these guys, brought them in, and and uh, Portal, you know, the game Portal. Uh, one of the reasons it's such a masterpiece is that it that uh, it is the writing that that went into it. Uh, I think Eric primarily Eric Wolpaw. Um, who's this just brilliant writer who um, who crafted this game? There's not a lot of dialogue in the, there's not a ton of story in a traditional way. There's you know there aren't a lot of cutscenes or so, but the, the the way the game is put together, but also what's happening with the the, the way they're using writing in Team Fortress Two, um, which is a which is a first you know it's a it's an action it's like a sport right it's a shooter a multiplayer competitive shooter. But the world around that game, the, the media around it, the way they're crafting yeah. uh, stories and characters, yeah. so you 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 know you that it's brilliant, um, and you you I think you need to, to like discover the stuff in there that so that's from from you know my perspective what I love that I'm seeing out there you have to find the things that you love and then just do stuff that's like that, and that's like that's like the last untapped not the last but I mean it's one of the untapped frontiers of games right now is like how you tell a story and how you incorporate the player into that, and it's yeah. like that's. We're, we're still trying to figure it out, and you yeah. know a lot of people yeah. are failing pretty spectacularly. But Team Fortress 2 is brilliant because it's not in the game at all. Like the game is in the story. Yeah. Right. The so story like, is not in the game. The game is in the story. So it's the, they're they're doing it for sure. Uh, there was a question over here, the young lady with the watch. <laughs> Make you go back and forth. <laughs> <laughs> it's over. It's getting to work out. Work at I've had in like a month. Yes, thank you. <laughs> uh, my question is actually related um, because it's voiceover, um, and um, I like I'm hearing two sort of themes of, it, of outsourcing because you're small, or just because of the nature of the fragmented um, process. Um, but and then also kind of a competing or or, a, or a different um, feeling of like we're small, where there's five of us and we're all cross hybrid, you know, cross hybridized and pollinating and kind of thinking outside the box and together and like we're all well integrated. So where does audio and voiceover fit into that? I mean, like, is um, you know, I don't want to move to LA. I really don't. And 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 it's I feel like there's room because like right now it's it's people in animation are are covering the video game base, but I feel like there's room with theater and, and audiobooks and other things in New York for a whole other video game community to rise. So I mean, is obviously you don't have voiceover people living in house unless you're using the office lady as you do. Yeah. But um. Yeah. Yeah, so I there's, mean, there's some that... audio. There's a couple of audio companies uh, in New York that do focus on the game industry. Um, so we cast we cast local. All of our guys that's are local, awesome. as far as I can tell. I think everybody is local. Um, so that's nice. Yeah. That's the other, yeah. I'm mean, just trying to do research and find out who knows games and cares about them as agencies yeah. or as, as houses. And it's yeah. you know, uh, Bang- audio brain. Audio brain. Michael Sweet. Yeah. Um, uh, Bangolia music Great. is another cool. one. Oh, you said Audio Brain and yep. Bangolia. Bangolia. It, awesome. It's also interesting to note that you know you have a company like Rockstar that's headquartered here that has production in Scotland and right. West Coast and and uh, but they do all of their cinematics and all of their actors and talent is done here and they actually just acquired a motion capture stage, so they they you know all the performers the the people that make up the game are are here in New What's York. What's the name of the mocap studio in Long Island? No, that's no longer. What was it was Perspectives, Pers- and it's now Rockstar. Oh, is it really? That's yeah. where we did okay. all of our mocap. Mm-hmm. Right. So, yeah. right. So, so, so you know, <laughs> Grand Theft Auto Four probably had more voiceover than any, not just any game that was ever made, but maybe any piece of media that was ever made. Yeah. yeah. So and there, and it happened yeah, here. And so, I, and I did have friends. And, and yeah. Like, so yeah. that's that's. Yeah. Wow. Thank you. Yeah. That's um, exciting. Can we go right here? In yes, you yes. Um, maybe just pass the mic over. Oh, I'm sorry. You, there's a big gap of. Humans, maybe we can pass it. <laughs> okay, nicely done. Um, yeah, I'm curious about uh, what you think about the indie scene here, um, like the Baby Castles arcade, that kind of thing, and how that fits into the bigger picture of um, the gaming industry as a whole. One of our level designers uh, works, or I don't know if you call it works at, but is involved with the Baby Castles thing. I think it's great. I, you know, I think it's, I don't know where it's going, but I'm very excited to see what's going to happen with it. I, it's one of those things that, like, it feels like it's going to be something that's going to define what the New York game scene is, if and when it's successful. Are, are people doing things like that in California? I mean, is that, and, and where does New York fit into that, I mean, as far as size or scope? I, I don't think it matters where you are in the indie scene. 
I mean, you've got the world of goo, which is still my favorite model. You know, the two guys, they didn't do it in their garage, they did it couch surfing. And, and uh, I think the indie, the, the indie game conference, the two days, it's like a little subsection of game developer conference. When I go to GDC, that's where I spend all my time. It's the most interesting part of the conference. It's pure game development. And I think it's the future because it, it, you don't need to put your game in a box anymore to sell it. So it, it's, it's, and it's super exciting to see the international guys too. Like the Minecraft guy. Yeah. Like he's, yeah. in, he's in his, like his parents' basement in Sweden and he like did three million units or something like that or three million dollars, some insane thing like that. Like I'm super excited to see. That is when, now the most awesome basement ever. Yeah, it's got a <laughs> and it's, it's all blocks though. Dexter, like, it's Dexter's itself. lab. Like I'm super excited to see like when the Indian, like when uh, uh, Indian people start making video games, like I want to see like the Bollywood Modern Warfare game. You know, like that's, I think those people have something to say and they have something to contribute to the process and yeah. I think it's going to be really interesting. Yeah, but I do think it, I mean Baby Castles is amazing. I'm so excited to see that and and talk about uh, people who are making stuff and doing stuff. Um, yeah. I mean that that is uh, that is fantastic. Um, and I think we uh, I think there is uh, I mean when you think about music, uh, like great indie music often emerges out of a local community, out of a mm -hmm. scene, out of people that know each other and hang out together physically. Yeah. Um, and I think there is some some value to that like co-location and just like bodies you know totally. uh, bumping into each other um so i think something like baby councils really really helps i mean I, and i think that's another advantage that new york has right we just we're bound to bump into each other a lot more than people in la right? a lot of bump. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah, how about stuff. maybe um one more question i think yes yes uh one of the panelists said that this is the first year the industry has realized there isn't going to be infinite growth forever and it seems that earlier this year, uh, the, the industry standard was how do we trick a 20 million people into buying our crappy game? Uh, and now that it's kind of become understood in the industry that it's, there's not gonna be infinite growth, is there a switch towards quality in upcoming products rather than <laughs> marketing? Yes. There's, there's gonna have to be, right? You know, there absolutely has to be. Cause like, you, I don't know if you saw the numbers on Medal of Honor, like they did 1.5 million units, all skews, all territories, and that's that's not great for a game of that scale. You know, that's like, and their long tail is not going to be significant, and it's a bad game. They but they tried to do like the, say Call of Duty, and do a mediocre job, and you know ship kind of a weird product that was sort of splintered, and it backfired on them. And so you're absolutely right. It's going to absolutely have to be quality, a, a total focus on quality for the big AAA games, because mm -hmm. those are the games that are successful. Those are the games people are buying. You know, your Red Dead's and your Grand Theft Autos. Yeah, and I think uh, if, if it's about quality and innovation, I mean, not to play into the stereotype of the rude New Yorker, but I think that that, that does kind of give us an edge. I mean, I think mm -hmm. that, that we can um, bring uh, a level of, 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 you know, cultural sophistication and, and innovation and, um, and smart, interesting, high quality uh, design and, and thinking to, to the world of games. And I think, I think that's, that's a really important point, too, is that, like, more so than quality, I think um, innovation is really the key. It's, it's the thing that people really get excited about. Because when people, like Minecraft is kind of an innovation in the way people play games. You know, it like, kind of took games and sort of threw it on its head and threw something new into the mix. And people were really excited about it. And Portal was another one. You know, where it like, I can't imagine that any level of additional fidelity would have made that game better. You know, it's like, it's all about the mechanic, it's all about the presentation, and it's all about the context. So, um, yeah, I think it's really more, even more about innovation and more about giving people something new rather than, you know, Call of Duty 97. Yeah. <laughs> so, that's our rallying cry. So um, I think we're going to wrap it up there. I'd like to thank our panel very much for coming. Thank you guys.